And at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker. Um, Seth M. Siegel is a serial entrepreneur, lawyer, water activist, and a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, recognized for his thought leadership and advocacy on water scarcity and quality. He's the author of the just released book, Troubled Water, which you have all probably received a copy of. And if you haven't, there are um, copies at the registration table, which you can, um, you can pick yours up um, anytime. Uh, this, is, this book is a critical look at America's drinking water. Seth is also the author of the award-winning international bestseller, Let There Be Water, uh, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World, which is available in more than 50 countries and 17 foreign languages. The book has won praise from Tony Blair, Michael Bloomberg, and Nobel laureate uh, Shimon Perez, among other global figures. Seth is a senior fellow at the University of Wisconsin Center for Water Policy, and his commentary has appeared in many leading publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as on television and radio. He has spoken about water issues before hundreds of audiences around the world, including in Congress, the United Nations, and Google's headquarters, as well as dozens of universities, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and of course, now MIT. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Seth M. Siegel. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to not only be here, but to be back here. I spoke at uh, the MIT Water Club uh, Summit uh, four years ago uh, when I was running around talking about water scarcity. And happily, at that time, the subject matter of my book uh, fit the theme of that year's conference. Um, and just remarkably, I write a new book, and once again, the theme fits. So I'm working on yet another book. I think I should coordinate exactly what the themes are going to be, because I, I definitely want to be invited back. I remember the last time I was here, it was a very different kind of drafty old auditorium. And to whoever uh, funded this, I think the development office at MIT really deserves a great big round of applause. This is a gorgeous uh, auditorium, so well, well done. <laughs> OK, so um, I want to tell you what I really am about before I get into talking on a series of, of comments for you. What I'm really about is about trying to popularize the conversation about water. What I'm really about is getting a national conversation going, and not just a conversation going amongst engineers or water professionals or water investors. I want to get a conversation going more widely. I want to have people talking about water the way we talk about other crucial public matters, climate change, energy policy, education policy, immigration policy, things that everybody has an opinion about because everybody knows something about, even if they oftentimes don't, but they seem to because it's in the popular consciousness. But that is just not true about water. And so although I had a wonderful and fascinating and very enjoyable career as a business executive, I made a decision after selling my company to devote the rest of my life to public policy issues. And so that is what I have been doing. A bit of a, since I'm in uh, Massachusetts, a little bit of a Paul Revere kind of feeling, running around talking about water, water, water everywhere, getting people to be more uh, conscious of it. And I hope, and I reach out to everyone here as I go from audience to audience, campus to campus, I hope to ask each of you something, which is we're coming up on Thanksgiving. Uh, everyone I know has gotten a copy of the book, and I uh, hope you enjoy it, and I'll talk to you about how you can keep in touch with me about it. And I think uh, Joe uh, Vesey from Xylem will be here tomorrow. He has underwritten the cost of these books for everybody here, so you should certainly say thank you to him. But what my goal here is, as a Paul Revere, is to get everyone talking about it, and everyone here can play a role in that as well. You all talk about water amongst your other fellow members of the Water Club, or perhaps in an engineering class you're taking, but in a week you're going to be at a Thanksgiving table. Give yourself an assignment. Give yourself an assignment to talk to somebody at the table, or everyone at the table, about some water issue. It could be drowning in plastic. It could be something you learned in these two days. It could be some other subject whatsoever. It doesn't matter. But let's start expanding the universe of people who understand that water is a crucial issue. It affects our economy, of course. And more importantly, it affects everybody's health. I'll be talking much more about that in a few minutes. So this is something that shouldn't just be 
a, I'm experiencing this for an hour, I'm experiencing this for a day or two days, this becomes part of life and everybody here can be, must be, should be an advocate. And I will also offer myself as a, as a model for anybody who would like to do this. I think my, uh, okay, if you want to reach me, you can reach me through my website, but also I can give you my business card, you can contact me. I hope, frankly, if I could, to have a relationship with absolutely everybody in this room, and I have developed a small army of people who I'm, I'm encouraging to do this with. Okay, point made. So, um, if last time my book was about water scarcity, a true problem, which my book has proven to be uh, prescient about all over the world, Water, the theme of the last book was if we don't get ahead of this water scarcity problem, whether for growing food or for people's uh, being able to live their lives, we're going to see, I predicted in the book, a mass of, of, uh, of refugees, water refugees around the world. And that I wrote that book before the Syrian civil war and the German uh, government accepting two million refugees into Europe, which destabilized all of European politics, had a bounce effect over across the Atlantic into the United States with uh, our politics here. But imagine if it's not two million refugees coming out of the Middle East and going into Europe, but it is tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of refugees coming from India, from Asia, from South America, from Sub-Saharan Africa, and from the Middle East. It, it will change our world in ways that we can't even comprehend. And I put, made the point then, I make the point now that we need to get ahead of that. There's been a lot of progress in the last four years, but I still think there's a lot more to be done. My new book, though, is not about water scarcity. It's not about water quantity. It's about water quality. So the book, What's uh, Troubled Water, What's Wrong With What We Drink, is also not about the world at large. It's only about the United States, although I have a hope, and I say this in the uh, forward to my book, in the preface to my book, that I hope that around the world people will take the book <clears throat> royalty free, as a license from me, and duplicate the book in, in their own country, in their own language, whatever, and do the same for their country. Because everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world, there is a water contamination problem that is totally unspoken of, and yet affects everybody. We believe, we have le led ourselves and gulled ourselves into thinking that what is legal is safe. And legal, I make the point, does not equal safe. I will close my remarks in 20, 30 minutes with that same thought, so if you haven't registered it yet, you'll hear it again. But to the extent that we assume that our federal agencies and our federal government and our state governments are purely looking out for our interest in every which way, I want to tell you, and I'm a middle of the road, you know, businessman, daddy kind of a guy. You know, it's like I'm not some crazy guy who says, you know, there's toxins everywhere. But I want you to know that our drinking water, which we think everywhere is perfectly wonderful and safe, has many contaminants in them, and we are not doing enough. I wrote this book to talk about many different issues, and if those of you who have the time to read it, I hope you will, and I hope you'll reflect on it and tell me what I missed. But there are four major issues in the book that I talked about, which is not the theme of my talk this morning, but I just want to quickly get it out there for those of you particularly who don't have time to read it. First is that we are grossly under-researching the water category, grossly under-researching it. There are, uh, depending upon how you want to classify it, there are between 100 and 120,000 chemicals, and if you include pharmaceuticals, a little bit more than that, uh, in, in 100 to 120,000 uh, chemicals that are in commerce on a regular basis in the United States, industrial solvents, pharmaceutical products, plastics, of course, and other chemicals. And yet, in that vast, vast, vast number, the EPA only regulates, which means that utilities have to monitor it and reduce it if it's found in large quantity. The EPA only demands of utilities a grand total of 70, 70 of them to be uh, monitored by utilities and regulated. It's a gross under amount, and as we know, we know that there are many others that are concerned for health, but as bad as that number 70 is versus the large number of possible contaminants that we're dealing with, the far worse number, and I talk about this at some length in my book, is the last time the EPA regulated any chemical, or anything for that matter, not just a chemical. The last time the EPA regulated any contaminant of any kind was 23 years ago. Well, every single year, two to 5,000 new chemicals enter the flow of American life. 
and something is amiss here. There's a mismatch. And I talk about, I don't have the time now to talk about it, maybe during the Q&A, but there's a mismatch in this, and we'll talk about this. So I said there were four things I want you to take away from my new book, if you don't have time to read it. First is we are under-researched. Second of all, we, and I'm not, I'm not sucking up to my wonderful MIT audience here, but we are in need of much, much more technology in the water field. For a long time, the mentality has been, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, there's a change of thinking now. People are beginning to understand that there's massive needs to rethink water in America at the utility level and at the municipal level. They don't have the money to do it. They don't have the money to dig up all the streets and change everything. But technology will be a great leveler, will be a great tool to democratize water use in America and to improve quality significantly. So those of you who are thinking of a career uh, in, in engineering or in invention, inventing, I think water is a place that you should be looking closely. The third area is price. Water, the price of water in America is mostly fanciful, although most everybody pays something for water. Very few people, very, very, very few people pay the real cost of their water. And so until people pay the real cost of their water, they'll have no incentive to conserve, market forces work, but much more significantly, the utilities will not have resources to buy the new technologies that you will be inventing. Once we get to the mindset that water price is too low almost everywhere, except for where it's too high, uh, we will not get this fixed. By the way, how could it be too low or too high? It's too high because in many, 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 many places in America, what they do is they jack up water prices because tax revenues are falling. Businesses have left the community, the tax base is declining, uh, people are leaving the community. This was the case in Flint, Michigan, by the way. They were a city of 200,000. They fell to about 100,000 people. The tax base fell. General Motors left. The tax base fell. They raised water prices 600%, but only a very small amount of that actually went to water and sewage. The result of which, the result of which was that it was, they beggared the water system, as we saw, but that's not just Flint. It's many, many places across the country. Water prices have to be higher. And the final of the four points I'd like to leave you with, but very quickly, is the fact that we have far, far, far too many utilities in the United States. We should have, my belief, we should have 150 to 300 utilities in the United States would be the right number. Then they could all have the proper uh, infrastructure, the proper staffing, the proper capital structure, the proper access to uh, banking and capital for doing great projects. But the real number, I, I, when I have more time to talk about my book, I sometimes have an audience game where I have people guess, and no one has ever come close to guessing because it's impossible to believe that in any intelligent, rational society you would agree to have a water system that has 51,000 51, water utilities in the United States and 107,000 separate special water districts leading to about 160,000 separate regulated water systems in the United States. It is madness. And what happens is that all but a very few of them don't have the money to do anything. They can't hire staff, they can't hire advanced, they can't hire MIT graduates, and they can't uh, buy the technology that, that needs to be put into systems, and they certainly can't replace broken pipes. So it's a big mess. Okay, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about plastic, so let's get to it. Yay, someone just said, damn, finally. <laughs> this woman said, I read the book. I don't need to hear all this. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about plastic. If we think about historical eras, we think in, in, in far, long ago time, we think of the Stone Age or the Iron Age or the Bronze Age. And those were eras that are defined by a dominant material that was used in the creation of, uh, of their civilizations of the time. And as primitive as it might have been, it worked. It moved society forward. If someday someone were to look back at our era, <clears throat> the last 50, maybe 75 years, what is the dominant material of our era? Plastic. It's plastic. We are at the plastics age. And while I suppose it is possible that somebody in the Iron Age or the Bronze Age could say, you know, I'm going to go on a retreat and I'm not going to touch iron or bronze for a day, uh, it is impossible. It is impossible for us to go even a day, I would say even an hour, without coming into contact in some way or another with plastic today. 
It permeates our lives. And so my point is, yes, you're holding a plastic pen. You're sitting on a plastic seat, by the way. It looks like a fiber, but it's a plastic fiber. Every, the carpet is plastic fiber. We are surrounded by plastic. And so the argument that I make is we can't stop plastic. It is there. It is part of our lives. We can think of better uses of it. We can think of better degradability of it. But we can't stop plastic. So therefore, we need to be much more conscious of its effect on us. We need to put into place infiltration systems. We need to make sure that we are making our water as pure as possible and not subject to the contaminants, the many contaminants that plastic generates. And we need also to make sure that we don't make things worse than they already are. And so I'm sure that today you're gonna to be hearing about the fact that 40% of all plastic is used only one time that only about 9% of all plastic is ever recycled. I'm sure you'll be hearing these from other speakers. I won't go into that stuff as much. I'm sure, and I talk about both of these in my book, I'm sure you'll be hearing from lots of people about the mad number of water bottles, disposable water bottles that are out there. Again, if I would ask you to guess how many water bottles we used last year in the United States, just purchased last year in the United States, you couldn't imagine the number. Uh, again, I've done this with other audiences, but I'll just tell you the number. Last year, 70 billion water bottles were sold in the United States. And the reason they were sold in the United States, and this goes back to my core thesis of, of troubled water, the reason why 70 billion bottles were sold is because a very large number of Americans, about 60%, have lost confidence in tap water. And I make the argument in this book that we can get back to where we once were, where there was universal confidence in tap water. And so nobody, and when I was a kid, when I was a college student, Absolutely nobody drank bottled water. It didn't exist in the United States in any fundamental commercial way until 1979. And then the companies were smart. They played on people's fears about tap water, but people responded to that because they were fearful of their tap water. And so there are a lot of bottles out there. We have a solid trash problem. Our oceans and our lakes are filled with these bottles. And so this is a problem that can be fixed, but that's not what I want to talk about today. Likewise, I don't want to talk about microplastics, which is an emerging area, particularly not microplastics in the ocean, but microplastics in fresh water, in lakes and rivers. I don't want to talk about that. I just want to mention it. It's mentioned and discussed in some detail in my book, and there's a fantastic uh, emerging area of young academics who are thinking about this new area of freshwater microplastics. I don't want to talk about that. I hope other people will. So what do I want to talk about? What? I want to talk about another place where plastic and water comes together, and that is an emerging area, an emerged area, that is a much under-discussed public health threat, and that is plastic pipes. Now, I'm sorry if that's a snoozer. I'm sorry it's early in the morning. I'm sorry if you had a late night and you think to yourself, geez, I really think I have time for me to close my eyes and feel the fluttering going on, and I'll see you in 40 minutes. Okay, let me know when somebody asks an exciting question during the Q&A. Okay, you're welcome, feel free. Okay, but I don't think that that's merited. I think actually that we are in a very interesting subject matter. It's something that could be the su subject of a, I think a thriller, a movie. Uh, you know, somebody here has to write it, it won't be me, but, uh, but I, I'd like you to star in it if you could, would you? I think you're in, okay. S see my agent afterwards, we'll get, you, we'll, we'll get the contract for you. Okay, it's a, Julia, it's a Julia Roberts part two, okay. What was that movie called? Uh, Aaron Brockovich, there you go, okay. So, so we're talking about um, especially two kinds of pipes today. There are many plastic uh, water pipes, particularly I wanna talk about PVC pipes and a kind of polyethylene pipe called PEX pipes. Now, you need to understand that these didn't just simply get invented and somebody said, ooh, these are really great, I wanna make use of them. And it is true that they are very good for in, on some level. They are lightweight, they are less expensive than ductile steel or cement or copper pipes. They're easy to install, they're long lasting, they don't corrode very much. Uh, on the negative, and I'll talk a lot about negatives, uh, just environmentally speaking, it's very hard to recycle them. So how is it possible that this has grown from a curiosity into a bonanza? And the answer is the large chemical companies, and I have to tell you, I am not 
an antagonist to business. I, am a, I was a businessman. I believe that business is an important part of the solution to every problem we have. I am very pro uh, business in the sense of the idea that business has to be part of almost every part of the equation in, in solving problems. But I am also a believer that business that is not being regulated, business is not being countervailed by people saying, oh, wait a second, what does this mean for me and my health? That we are going to have problems. And in this case, we are having a problem. The large petrochemical companies, and I'm not going to name names today, but the large petrochemical companies have made billions and billions of dollars selling resin, selling the feedstock to make PVC pipes, to sell these PEX pipes and other plastic pipes. And before we go crazy, they've already been in the market for quite a number of years, but before we go crazier, and we're about to go crazier, I would say that we should perhaps think of ourselves as maybe going into a time machine. Because and I did a lot of research on this for my book. As I thought to myself, lead, you know, I was thinking about flint and the implication of, of lead pipes. You know, it's about as many as 10 and a half million lead pipes in this country. In New York, where I'm from, New York State, 80%, 80% of the schools in New York State are fed by lead water pipes. It's, no, it's dangerous for everyone, but most dangerous for children. So how did that happen? And the answer is, at some point, some very smart, very caring engineers thought, this is a good product. Or so I thought. And I went back and I discovered, lo and behold, there was a lead industry trade association who encouraged people to think that lead was the great thing and kept minimizing health threats. But if we could go into a time machine and go back to an era before there was widespread adoption of lead, and we'd ring the bell and say, wait a second, it's a very good material, but it's very bad when it gets into the bodies, particularly of children, we probably would not have installed, you know, 10 and a half million lead pipes in the United States. Was that, and, like, was that like 100 years ago? Uh, was that like 100 years ago? It was, um, it was worse than that. What's your name? Diana. Diana. Diana asked the question, was that 100 years ago? Which she could have asked, was that 500 years ago? The answer is, um, in Chicago, anybody here from Chicago by any chance? Chicago, a lot of you. In Chicago, until 1986, it was mandatory, it was required by law that you could not use a water pipe into your home other than a lead water pipe. It was, it, you could not use steel or any other material. You had to use a lead pipe. So no, it was not, it was not 100 years ago, although it's starting in 1880, again, it's all in my book, but starting in 1880 in a very large move as, as cities began building out their water systems. Yes. So, so if we could go back in time, we wouldn't have installed those lead pipes. If we could go back in time, as good as a material as asbestos is, as a fire insulator, we would not have been lining all of our pipes with asbestos because we came to understand the dangers. And now we have come to understand the dangers of these plastic pipes, and my argument is slow down. And the reason why I want to say slow down especially is something that's going on that nobody here probably knows about, but I want to tell you, and that is those same uh, industry associations in the plastics industry, the chemical companies, what they are doing is they are trying to pass into law, a federal law, they are trying to get passed a law that says that if any municipality gets any federal funding, everyone does, that means everybody, if anyone is replacing water pipes in their municipality, they must take into effect what is the cheapest source available. And they must therefore use the cheapest source available. Well, I got news for you. Just on raw cost of acquisition of material, PVC or PEX pipes will always, always be cheaper than a steel pipe. If you're just talking about one pipe sitting next to another pipe, if you're not talking about pumping costs or replacement costs or health costs. So therefore, I would say before we go crazy and now go from a system where everything is has other time known uh, substances that we know are relatively safer, not dangerous for the environment, we should be careful before we run forward with something else. I'm not antagonistic to any industry. I'm antagonistic to having something jammed down my throat that may affect my health, and more importantly, the health of my family and your families. So what are these dangers? I want to talk about three of them today. There are obviously others, and I'd be glad to be in touch if anybody wants more information. There's a lot of emerging scholarship on this area. Very much underfunded category. 
Uh, there's not, it's not easy for academics to get grants, and the federal government is the major source of that funding for academics. So there are three areas of concern. First is just a general environmental concern. The production, particularly of PVC, which stands for poly polyvinyl chloride, has an environmental problem. In its production, PVC produces lots of vinyl chloride. Vinyl chloride is a known human carcinogen. It is known to cause liver cancer and brain cancer. It also creates all kinds of disorientation because it it's a neurotoxin. And there's emerging studies now that suggest that it may also be a source of breast cancer. So we know that it's not a healthy thing. It's, it doesn't come to you at the manufacturing by virtue of drinking it. So it's not a waterborne problem, but it is a problem of inhalation. And also it's called dermal absorption. It gets through, through your eyeballs and through your skin. And therefore, unless a factory and a facility that is installing it and using it knows how to do it properly, then I would say um, you, you, that the people who are around it have a problem and the people who live in the area around it have a problem. And my topic today is not at all environmental justice, although I address it in my book, but not a big surprise that the places where this stuff is manufactured tends to be in poorer communities and largely in communities of color, which I find something that, you know, if we're, if we're going to all have the benefit of something, we should all have the burden of it as well. It shouldn't be fobbed off onto the poorest and most uh, dispossessed of our society. There was a study that just came out from the, uh, I don't remember their exact name, but it's like kind of like the American Association of Firefighters, or it's a name like that, but it's not quite that, uh, that said that the greatest source of danger to firefighters today is not the harm from a fire directly, but actually from the inhalation of burning plastic water pipes. They estimate that for every fireman killed by uh, a fire, smoke inhalation of fire, 30 for everyone who die in a fire, 30 die from a cancer at a young age, die from a cancer from an inhalation of one of these burning pipes. So the first of my three areas is the environmental risk of PVC particularly. Second area I want to talk about is something that everybody talks about today, and I don't want to not be part of it. I think we should be, and that is climate change. How does climate change and PVC pipes, what, what's the connection there, huh? Well, I'll tell you the connection. The connection is that, first of all, we're having all kinds of unusual weather events these days, right? A lot of floods, less rain in some places, much, much, much more rain in other places. That much, much, much more rain is causing flooding. So what happens when there's flooding? It destabilizes the soil. And destabilized soil has an effect, a seismic effect akin to an earthquake. And it pops the joints of PVC pipes and creates a problem of infrastructure. And that's bad. But a far, far worse impact of climate change on PVC and other plastic pipes is the other corollary part of an effect we're seeing from climate change, which is fires. We're seeing all kinds of wildfires now, and we think of wildfires. When I was a kid, we thought of wildfires as sort of, I grew up in Queens, New York, so we didn't have a lot of trees, and uh, you know, the idea of wildfires was something uh, totally out of a news report. You know, I thought of it as sort of a national park somewhere out there, and it was very sad for the deer and the elk, but you know, it didn't affect civilization. But as society grows and as communities are being built from scratch, what we're discovering is that wildfires are now not somebody else's problem. Anybody here from California by any chance? Yeah. So you follow the news out of the last few months? What's going on there? And also, well, I'm, only, I'm, I'm being very parochial here. I'm just talking about America today, but absolutely Australia, but not just Australia. South America, problem too. But I'll be just very parochial and just think about what our needs are. California has had a series of wildfires that aren't like out there, like 100 miles from the nearest person, but right there at people's doorsteps. Thousands of people have been dislocated from homes. Hundreds and thousands of homes have been destroyed. And so when there's a wildfire that comes into a place that has PVC pipes, it is mayhem. And why is it mayhem? Because unlike ductile steel or cement or copper pipes, what happens to plastic pipes when it's exposed to fire? It melts. It burns and then it melts. It melts. And what does that mean? It means several things. First is, what can't you do when you have your water pipes have melted? You can't use them to fight the fires. So from an emergency point of view, you have shot yourself in the foot. 
you can't fight your fire because you don't have the water source to fight the fire with. But far worse, if it can be worse, is that what happens with that plastic pipe? It melts. What does it melt into? It melts into the groundwater. Any here, anyone here know about Paradise, California? Anybody here heard of Paradise, California? Most of you, okay. You know the community is uninhabitable, not because 13 or 14,000 homes were burnt. It's uninhabitable because the water has to be completely remediated in a very large swath of territory because of the melted plastic pipes. And the third part, remember I said a few minutes ago about the firemen who inhale those pipes? Well, while those pipes are burning, gases are being released, and people, firefighters and others, are inhaling that. There's highly toxic, highly dangerous chemicals. So you can't fight the fire while the pipes are burning, so you have to stand back because you're worried about the fact of getting your firefighters some toxic il illness. So it's a, it's a cycle that mean, they meant well, I'm sure. Now, plastic pipes are about you know, 20, 30, 40% of the cost of more traditional pipes. So it makes sense why a community would say, hey, this is a great pass, we can save money, how fabulous. But it's not a good idea. You don't want to have your water source contaminated. You don't want to have yourself unable to fight your fires. And the third area, and this is our last point of the drowning in plastic, uh, is that plastic water pipes, even when they are working exactly as intended, no fires, no floods, it's long shipped from the factory, the problem is that plastic is not a stable material like metal or glass, and that contaminants leach from the plastic into the water, particularly in the first seven years of use, and that puts people, particularly young children, immunosuppressed older people, at particular risk of all kinds of neurological ailments and other, other problems, which are, I would say are largely under-researched, so we don't know the scope of the problem from that. A researcher whom I know and respect has used mass spectrometer work to extract from PVC pipes and says that because of the way PVC pipes are made, you take petrochemical feedstock, and these petrochemicals are made up of lots of different chemicals themselves. And so when it all comes together, there's a leaching of very, many very different, and this scientist did a study, and he found 150 different contaminants of one kind or another leaching from the plastic pipes into the drinking water. Now, I talk in my book about the problem about bottled water as one of which that the plastic leaches chemicals into the water, so we think we're having a safe drinking water experience, better than tap water. It's, it's, a, it's a fool's paradise. But it's also a devil's bargain for us to make a deal to say, I want to have cheaper plastic pipes in my home, but at what cost? And this is where it goes back to my first point that I made about my, this book, which is that, uh, about troubled water, which is that I say we are grossly, grossly under-researched. There is just not enough research being done about tap water. There's not enough research being done about the effect of plastics uh, leaching into bottled water. For sure, not that. And there is absolutely not nearly enough research, not even close to enough research, on what it means to have these different chemicals and chemicals coming together, not one at a time, but in a cocktail, as it were, of many different kinds of chemical contaminants coming together. So I am not opposed, believe it or not, after all this, to using plastic pipes in the right settings. But we have to be smart about this and careful about this. We have to be careful because hazards, when they are there, we have to avoid them. Or if we say we really want to move forward with plastic pipes, we have to figure out ways of mitigating the risks. And if we don't want to even do that, then this is what we must do. We must be honest with everybody. We have to say to a community, OK, if you want to save money, you can. Put it up for a vote. Put it up for a vote to everybody. Do you want to save money on the installation of your new pipes in your city? Terrific. We want you to know that these are the known risks to this. It's not everyone. Not everyone will die. It's not like cholera or dysentery or typhoid fever. But there's a risk. If you are prepared to have that risk for yourself, for your children, if you're prepared to know that you may not be able to sell your home if the risk found to multiply, Okay, but you have to go into this knowingly. 
This can't be snuck into people's homes and snuck into people's streets without them being aware of it. I said at the outset that uh, I had one phrase I want to leave everyone with, and if you don't remember it, I said I'd repeat it, and that is that legal does not necessarily equal safe. It may, but it may not. And as we expand our conversation around our Thanksgiving tables and nationally, as we have more people talking about this, we will have a better outcome. I had meant to actually to, I took this with me and I forgot, I got so engaged by talking to you, I forgot to show the one prop that I brought with me. Uh, by the way, I apologize, I know it's an academic audience, I apologize that I didn't use a PowerPoint. I was told by a friend of mine, I was told by a friend of mine yesterday that you're going to MIT and you didn't prepare a PowerPoint? What, what, what are you gonna do? I said, oh, I'm just gonna talk to them. So he said, no, no, they will be very unhappy. So I hope I hadn't offend anybody by not having a PowerPoint. I didn't mean to offend anybody. I just thought it would be less distracting for me and maybe better for you. I wanted to, I did bring one prop though, uh, flying up here on a four hour delayed flight from New York City. I could have walked almost faster. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I, I had the Wall Street Journal uh, in the seat next to mine. And I saw that they had a special section. I don't know if everybody can see it. I don't know if your camera can zoom in on that there back there. Could, could, could you, Dana, could you repeat the? It just says swearing off. No, no, this up here. Energy. Energy, a special section in the Wall Street Journal, America's largest newspaper on energy. Okay, you know when we will say hallelujah, we have won? When there's a special section in the Wall Street Journal about? Water. Exactly, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I have, I, I still have the same 50 minutes, right? So, so I have about uh, 20 minutes to take questions. And since you've been my, by the way, I, I just want to say I, I, I'm glad to sign everyone's book. I understand everyone got a book uh, today. If you didn't, please get it downstairs. And everybody who says hello to me, or if you have me sign your book, you don't have to have me sign your book. Uh, everybody who says hello to me gets a special limited edition collectible bookmark prepared by my publisher. It's a big deal, they tell me. So. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I, I was signing uh, books uh, in Long Island the other day, and this woman, I don't think she was supposed to take more than one, but she took three books, and she sa I said, what's your name? She said, no, 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 don't make it out to me, just sign your name. So I said, you sure? She said, yeah, yeah, she says, don't, don't, don't do anything. She said, I'm putting it up for sale on eBay, so don't ruin it. <laughs> so, so, but, uh, so, but you can't do that, because yours are stickered with compliments of Xylem. Okay, you're first. Uh, and I'll repeat the Hang question. Just, I'll repeat the just, question. Uh, one second here. So we're going to have, for a Q&A, we're going to have two mics on the side. So if you have a question. But, Taylor, can, um, but she's been yeah, such she a great can, supporter. So tell, me a, question. tell yep. me a question. I'll repeat it. What water do you drink? Oh, what water do I drink? You mean the, the are you a hypocrite question? <laughs> so what water do I? Based on everything you know, yeah. how do you navigate? And you travel a lot. Yeah. So, so you, how do I, what, what do I drink? Um, uh, it's a good question and it's a fair question. And by the way, I talk in my book. My book is not just doom and gloom and about all the miserable things that can happen to you. <laughs> my book is also, is also filled with solutions. The back third of the book talks about what I call water heroes, people who have made a real difference, who have made our water safer and better, and hopefully all of you can do the same. Um, and I would say that um, I also have the very last, last chapter, what you can do in your home while we're busy waiting for the federal government, the state government to get going. So, so, and there's a woman who I admire very much who's coming out with a terrific book next year. She's a scientist at Mount Sinai Medical Center who has done this amazing research that has determined that in the past 40 years in the United States, sperm count in America, it's a little early in the day to talk about that, sorry, but sperm count in America has dropped by 50%. And her belief is that it's because of environmental insult, uh, assaults. So I asked her, well, she doesn't produce sperm, but, you know, married woman. So I, I said to her, so what do you and your family uh, drink? And she said, I don't drink tap water. I don't prepare food with tap water. Obviously, she says bottled water is highly hazardous. And she's not a kook. I mean, she's a like, really sane, nice person. So, um, I, 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 so, so what do you do? So she, she has a distillation unit on her countertop, and she distills her water. And I would like to do that, but I suspect... Um, I live in a small Manhattan apartment, so I, I don't know that I could do that, but uh, I, I would like to do that. What I do do, this is the straight answer, is what I do do is I do not drink um, uh, tap water at what I'll call in any rural areas. I have, a, I have a weekend home in eastern Long Island in a farm area. 
I will not drink tap water there because of the years of pesticides and herbicides and nitrates that I know are percolating in that water. In New York City, I, I, I prefer to drink water out of glass bottles because it's a stable material, but I do admit that I'm one of those about 30% of Americans who mix the use of tap water. Uh, the statistics are amazing. A third of Americans drink no tap water whatsoever, only bottled water. Another 30% drink, uh, like me, drink a mixture of tap water and bottled water with a, with a bias towards stable material uh, water. So that's, that's the answer. Okay, uh, who do, you first. Tell, just tell me your name, your first name if you would. Oh, sorry, I'm not asking questions. Oh, managing. I can. Oh, I can, okay. I oh are you asking a question? So yeah, for everyone else, uh, you can just line up behind the mics if you have questions, and we'll take as many as we can in the time we have. Yeah, but I sure. I do have a question. So I'm Andrew, I'm with the MIT Water Club. Yeah, you, and so, that's right. You, you, you and Patricia, right? Yeah, so we're... And, uh, by the way, can we all just say thank you to Adrian, Andrew, and Patricia, and the committee that put this together? Thank you. You know, no, nothing happens by itself, and if we're going to have this conversation about water, we really need to have people like you to lead the charge. Oh, I said I was going to give everybody my email address. Uh, it's, you can get it from the website, but if you want to be more... Since you're so nice, and I feel like you're all my friends now, um, Seth at SethMSiegel.com. Feel free, if, you, if you're on Twitter, please follow me on Twitter. I tweet about water all the time, and I'll direct uh, message anybody who wants to do it that way. I really am serious about this. I really want to have partners and friends and, and, and mentors. I want you to teach me what you're learning, sending me articles about things you're finding that we can help popularize. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, so uh, I guess briefly the question I have is so, uh, there's a saying like, don't, get, don't let perfect get in the way of good, or don't let perfect get in the way of better. Yeah. So if plastic is uh, not what we want in our water pipes, and obviously I don't think you would be advi uh, advising lead, um, what would you say is like the best material that we have right now for, for water pipes, if plastic yeah. isn't the answer? So, so okay, so there are, there are a bunch of different kinds of water pipes, and uh, I, I'm embarrassed to be at MIT and explaining different kinds of water pipes, because I'm a liberal arts major from a, 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 another uh, nice, good school, but you know, not, I couldn't have gotten into MIT, let me just say that, okay? Even when the standards were easier a bunch of years ago. But I will say is that, um, so I just wanna explain that there are, in the main, there are kind of like, call it three different kinds of pipes in, that people uh, should be mindful of. The first pipe is water mains. And that's the big pipes, relatively big pipes, they're not always that big, but they can be very big pipes, that go from a central distribution facility to throughout the streets of your town, and then branching off of each of those is called the service line, which unfortunately too many of them are lead. And then there's of course the pipes that meander through your, your home. So um, the, the, the ductile steel pipes, the big ones, the ones that municipalities are now having to decide to replace with steel or cement or with plastic is the one that I'm primarily speaking about today, is the water mains. The pipes that go into your home Unfortunately, lots of developers, because they're trying to bring down the cost of the house and increase the profitability per house they're building, unfortunately, many, many, many of them are using plastic pipes. And I think that that's a question that people want to be asking. There's also, by the way, I didn't get into it because I wanted to focus on drinking water today, Andrew, but also there are other uses for plastic pipes, like for sewage lines and so forth. And the problem there is it's not going to, then the problem isn't the third one, which is you're going to drink it in or they're going to have it, but it affects the other areas that we talked about. It still is an environmental threat and it's something we should be thinking about before we jump willy-nilly into that area. Um, uh, he defers to you. Thank you. Just say um, your first name if you would. Sure. I'm Heather O'Brien. I'm a community planner at a nonprofit called Harbor Keepers in Boston. Thank you for and your good service to us. Thank you. Um, and I had a question about the 70 billion water bottles. Yeah. Are those single-use water bottles? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 70, boy, am I going to have a shorter question and answer? No. Okay. <laughs> yes. Single-use. Yep. Yeah, we're not talking about, I don't know if everybody got this or if you have to buy it, but this utterly incredible MIT, are we selling this or giving it away? I can't say enough good things about this water bottle. In fact, <laughs> what do they cost? How much are they out there for? Uh, 20? Okay, you buy two of them, I'll get the second one for you for 15 bucks. Okay, good deal. <laughs> and by the way, I don't know about you all. I've got, by the way, just so you should know, everywhere I go, they either give me a coffee mug or a water bottle. I mean, I'm a water guy. They give me the same thing over and over again. But I want you to know, 
I have not gotten a T-shirt like this. And last time I came here, I did not get a T-shirt. So if you invite me back, I'll take the polar fleece next time, OK? <laughs> oh, you want to turn it around? OK, here we go. Oh, here you go. <laughs> OK, fabulous. OK, uh, you had a question, I think? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for speaking. And speaking. Just tell us your name, sir. Uh, Paul. And if we're going to build a community, we're going to know each other, right? My name's Paul Lake. I work for Watts Water Technologies. Watts Water? Mm -hmm. Give my regards to Roberto. OK, he's my boss. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, will you? Will you tell him I, I asked for him? I will. Yep. Yeah, fabulous. Great. I, I'm, I'm the corporate plastics engineer, so I'm probably the bad guy. But No, but not a bad guy at all. I know. I understand. One of the things... We, that, we all respond to the incentives we're given. All I am saying is, let's align society's incentives with industry's incentives. I am not antagonistic. I am not, I am not a radical person. I am not a screaming Mimi. I don't want to ban you or anything. I, what I want to see is an alignment of your interests and my interests for the greater common good. That's all I want. OK. okay. Right. And I, Paul, I was just, just Paul, teasing. Go for it. I was just teasing with that. Okay. Because that's my question. Have you um, tried to align with the major plastic manufacturers at the source? Like for PVC, you know PVC is bad because the, the um, liberation of chlorine during burning and all that, it, it degrades down to its toxic monomers. So I, I think it would be really good, and it's a hard thing to do, but work at the source, if possible, you know, through legislation, you know, uh, try to make the elephant dance, um, do, so, do something to try to get it at the source. Okay, I love your question. And may I give a little riff on that? That's not a direct, can I talk about something other than plastic pipes? Sure. I want everyone here to understand why and how we're gonna get cleaner, safer water in America. Do you know how we're gonna get it? We're gonna get it when people demand it. The industry will not self do it on its own. It will do it, unless there's an economic reason to do it. It will do it the moment it has to do it. And the moment it has to do it is when the politicians start squeezing them. But the politicians, and I believe in the political system, I'm one of the seven people who still do, there are, the, the politicians will not do what they need to do until they feel the pressure of the public. And I'm sorry to tell you the story. I just told you during the coffee hour. I apologize that you can hear it a second time. I want to tell everyone a quick story. And this is how we get change. But I don't have one story like this. I have 50 stories like this. Every single improvement in water has not come top down, not once. Every single time it has come from people like you all. What happened to your friend? Where'd she go? Oh, oh, she's over there. Oh, good. You could ask me a question over here. OK. So, so it happened every single time when people like me I mean, who was, a, I'm not a water engineer, I'm not a water person. I got concerned, I got worried. I started thinking, what about myself? What about my kids? I, have, I had cancer a few years ago. And like I told the story in chapter one of the book, I, it was a cancer that didn't make sense that I got it. I have no idea if it came from water, but it had me start to think about what are the sources of these things? What is affecting our society? Why is there suddenly this explosion of endocrine disrupting compounds in our water that is affecting us? Why is there this explosion of ADHD? Why are there behavioral problems? Why is there infertility problems? Why are these things happening that on a statistical basis are higher than ever before? Why is this wonderful scientist I mentioned at Mount Sinai Medical Center telling us that all of a sudden, what's happened? How did this happen? That all of a sudden, we have reduced sperm count, 100,000 year old species, and for the first time, we have a change in us. What's going on here? And so the answer is it's something is something in the water, perhaps. And so it changes when all of us say we're upset about something. And I'm going to tell you a story, a historical vignette, but as I say, I could tell you 20 or 30 or 50 of these, because every single time there's a change, there's a person like me and like you and like you and like you who says, I don't want this anymore. I want a different stream of thinking. In 1962, in the fall of 1962, a woman named Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. I'd be surprised if many of you have heard of the book. It's not important that she gets any credit or that her book is remembered. But what she provoked is what's important. She writes a book in fall of 19, comes out in the fall of 1972, and it's read by moms, and it's read by media, and it's read by mayors. There's no such thing in 1962 as the environmental movement. There is no, not one, environmental organization in 1962. There are conservation organizations, Sierra Club, Audubon Society, National Wildlife Federation. That's what exists. There is no such thing as environmentalism yet. 1962, the book starts to have people talking. 
at Thanksgiving tables, perhaps. People talking to each other. Did you know this? Did you know this? And the book is not about water. The book is about DDT pesticide. It gets people talking. April 22nd, 1970. Anybody know what that date is? The first Earth Day. The first Earth Day. And what happened on that first Earth Day? The first Earth Day, 40% of all Americans, students, homemakers, workers, retirees, 40% of all Americans participated in one or more Earth Day activities on that April 22nd, 1970. And I'm gonna tell you who didn't participate that day in any Earth Day activities. The then President of the United States, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was no friend of the environmental cause. Okay, but what's the punchline of my story? December 2nd, 1970, anybody know what that date is? It's the date that the EPA is created. It's less than eight months from the first Earth Day, it's eight months and a few weeks from the publication of Silent Spring. And who and how is the EPA created? Not by Congress, but by executive order by Richard Nixon. The politicians, Paul, respond when we demand. It does, only in, only, in, only in the movies is it the other way around. Only in the movies does Mr. Smith go to Washington and change the system. It changes when we demand it and they respond. That's the answer. Deanna. Sorry, just back to continue about you may. pipes. Pipes, Cop yeah, I'm happy to go back to pipes. Copper. What's that? Where does copper fall? Co okay, so copper, uh, copper, is, um, copper falls right in the middle. Copper, um, depending upon the acidity of the water, um, uh, copper can have some hazard to it, but if it's a low acidity water, and you'll know that from your water, uh, and engineers will know that, uh, it's a very good material, it's highly recyclable, it's stable, uh, and so and it doesn't produce uh, a, a, any toxic. Uh, side. Fires. Oh, the fires are fine. I mean, it's a it's metal. It's so so it, it, yeah. Well, everything melts at a certain heat, but yeah, no. But co co copper is also fine. Yes. Uh, you you yes. Tell us your first name. Hi, my name is Manuela. I'm at Manuela? Sloan right now. Hi. Thanks for coming in today. I love it. Um, so my question is, uh, can you point us to resources? that do demonstrate um, a link between health problems and plastics? I know that there's BPA links, especially for babies, but um, I'm curious about being able to answer that question when people say, well, why is plastic bad? I haven't been able to find anything that yes. directly connects the two. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah, by the way, I can offline also very easily, uh, but the answer is that I need to help, if I can, rephrase your question for you, may I? Yeah, please. So, to, Manuela, to, the, to think about it differently is plastic is a kind of chemical, but there are several thousand different varieties of it. And each of them have different, um, different properties. They're invented, uh, by definition, plastic is a man-made, it doesn't occur in nature. And so it, it is, each is created with a desire to produce a certain kind of reaction to be more flexible, and we didn't talk about flexibility, which is an important issue, uh, so I'll just say it very, very quickly as part of this. Almost every plastic that has to have any flexibility, because plastic is by nature very inflexible, has something called a phthalate added to it. Phthalate is also a significant source. It leaches into water, and it's also a significant source of, of problem. I didn't mention my core remarks, because I didn't want to get at this. This is not a theory, this is just confirmed science. But what you need to do is, so is not to say what comes out of plastic, but what comes out of PVC or, or, or polyethylene or, or whatever it is that you're looking for as a specific cause and effect. And, and it's as simple as Googling it, by the way, is putting in health, health effects of, and then you know, list the plastic that you're interested in, and you'll see lots of stuff pop up. But if you wanna have like uh, peer-reviewed scientific articles, just we'll trade business, we'll trade the emails or business cards afterwards, and I'll be glad to get you lots of information. Yeah, I'll send you an email. Thank you. Sure, no problem at all. I think we have time for one last one. If there's a last one, yes. Hi, my name is Jackie. Hi, Jackie. I'm the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, my uh, question is and comment is about 15 years ago. Oh, closer to the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 15 years ago, I went to a water talk in Modesto, California, of all places, and um, and the, the water guy there was telling us that. We don't have a shortage of water. We were in a drought, and um, he said we have a shortage of potable water, and that that was going to be the 
the problem. Um, he talked about Monsanto and Roundup and how they always said it biodegrades and, and you know will go away, but it was showing up in our water tables 15 years ago. Um, so the leaching that happens through all types of different chemicals when you talk about these rural areas is, is a cause of concern. But also when you were talking about the fires um, in California as well, they're, they're spraying this other chemical with PFA, PFA, PFAS on it um, that's even, you know, that, that's another form that's just getting into uh, the water table. Do you... Do you talk about the the PFAS in your book and only in chapter one? Okay, I'm making a joke. Yes, I start the book talking about PFAS. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, right. yes, because um, it's because it's a perfect example of everything I'm trying to say. I opened my book in a small town in upstate New York, uh, a short drive from the Vermont border, a bucolic Norman Rockwell esque town called Hoosick Falls. I would give a dollar or a free bookmark to anybody who's telling me they've been in Hoosick Falls. Anybody here been to Hoosick Falls? You've been to Hoosick Falls? Oh my God, okay, we gotta talk, okay. So, uh, it's fantastic. And did you in the back, you, you've been in Hosick Falls? Or you just want a free bookmark? Okay, got it, okay. Uh, so, um, okay, so Hoosick, Hoosick Falls is this wonderful, bucolic, gorgeous little town, upstate New York. It's just sort of the, a center of, you kind know, of what you dream of for life, you know, nice people and neighbors caring for neighbors and, and, uh, you know, people working hard and saving and nobody too rich, nobody too poor. You know, it's just sort of like America as we think it should be kind of place. And the problem was that the core industry of the town was the manufacture of Teflon, which had as a core ingredient, uh, Jackie, is it? Yes. Yeah, a core ingredient was uh, the material that is called PFOA. Uh, and PFOA is kind of a PFAS chemical. PFAS is a general, it's like plastic, it's a category. It's an all fluorine based uh, chemicals like that. And PFOA and PFOS are the two major uses of PFAS chemicals. And so everyone in the town is just so like they're happy to have jobs and it's a major employer, as I said. And then little by little, people in the town, not immediately, again, it's not cholera where everyone dies three hours later. Uh, little by little, some years after they start this industry in the town. People start getting unexplained illnesses and people have problem pregnancies and some birth defects and some cancers and dogs that are healthy suddenly are not healthy and have to be put down. And none of this really makes sense. And the hero in a sense of my book is someone who is a model for all this because Paul Revere maybe was a very special person. I don't know his life story. But the hero of this story is an everyman. No one, I, I would say this if he was sitting right here, he's a wonderful person, but he's no one special. He went to a no-name college, he was a business major at this no-name college. He came back to this little town, he was the fourth generation on one side, fifth generation on the other side. And he made a modest living and uh, working in, insur in insurance and you know, just lived his life. And then his father got kidney cancer, was treated here in Boston. Father died a horrible death. And this man named Michael Hickey couldn't figure out what was going on. He just didn't, under, didn't understand it. It was a cancer that didn't make sense genetically. It didn't make sense cluster-wise. None of it made sense. And then he was noticing also lots of people in the town were getting sick. And he wasn't an epidemiologist and he wasn't compiling statistics. But one day he did something very basic. He did an internet search, and he discovered that Teflon had an active ingredient called PFOA, and the PFOA had been tied to kidney cancer. And he didn't know it that night, but he found out later that it was also tied to testicular cancer and ulcerative colitis and all kinds of serious life-threatening complications for pregnant women. And suddenly the parts of the town started to make sense. So he goes to the mayor of the town, who's a friend of his, and he says, I think I found something terrible. We have to test the water. And the mayor says to him, saying that you're gonna say, oh my God, this is so terrible. And if it was a movie, you'd say, oh, the villain. But unfortunately, this is the standard response. And to Paul's, to Paul's question, from what's water? From Paul's question, it's the same answer. The mayor says to him, Michael, are you crazy? You wanna scare people? Just forget about this. Forget everything you've learned. Don't say another word. 
So Michael, who doesn't have money to spare, goes out on his own cost, has the water tested in the town. And he finds out that the then EPA, legal does not equal safe, the then EPA level for PFOA, advisory level, was 200 parts per billion. And in his house, it was 540. And his father's house, it was 440. And he knew that was no good. So he starts to make trouble in town. And instead of being a hero where people celebrate him, they think of him kind of as an enemy of the people, if you know the Henry Gibson play. But little by little, he per per persevered. And he challenged the chemical companies in his town. And he got the people in his town behind him. And he got some local officials to realize, oh, wow, this could be another Flint, Michigan for me. I could get myself embarrassed. I could get myself arrested. I could get myself thrown out of office. Wow. And now Hoosick Falls has completely filtered water undetectable levels of PFOA, too late for his father, obviously, who died, too late for dozens and dozens of people in the town, young people in their 20s and 30s who have terrible cancers. But he's a hero. Now, he's not in a crusade to fix all of America, but he fixed his community. It's a start. It's also a model. I'll stop there. I'd love to stay in touch with anybody who'd like to stay in touch with me, my email, my Twitter, at all. Love you all. Let's do it together. Bye-bye. <laughs>